Thank you very much for staying. Welcome back to the Markets Place. Now, private sector firms account for a larger chunk of loans that banks fear might not be paid back on time rather than government companies. That's according to the latest banking sector report by the Bank of Ghana. George Yuafi has more on this. The Bank of Ghana report puts the total non-performing loans as at April this year at around 7.15 billion Ghana cities, representing a 24.5% increase from the 5.74 billion Ghana cities in April 2016. According to the report, the private sector share of the 7.15 billion Ghana cities stock of non-performing loans was 97%, representing an increase of about 11%. Most of these loans that have not been paid back on time was held by firms operating in the commerce and finance sector. It was believed the government was the biggest cause of this problem, which has led to the high interest rates being charged by commercial banks. But the Bank of Ghana report shows that it was rather the private sector. The inability of these firms to pay back the loans on time has actually resulted in some high interest rates which the bank have argued that they had to share the cost with potential borrowers. However, some of the private firms have also argued that their inability to pay these debts is due to government indebtedness to them, as a lot of them have also rendered services to the state the government has delayed in paying them. Now, Barclays Africa says it's still interested in establishing an offshore banking facility in Ghana. This was after the then Kufo administration moved to establish an international financial services center in the country. Barclays was forced to shut the facility after the NDC administration moved to close the center over fears the country could become a haven for money laundering. Chief Executive Officer of Barclays in charge of other regions in Africa, Peter Matler, tells the bank now wants to focus on finalizing the sell down by Barclays UK before looking at this option. So my short response to that is it's certainly one of the strategies we're evaluating and looking at right now and uh, I'm sure over the next short to medium term you'll see us executing against one or two new things. We haven't firmed up on that yet but certainly we recognize it as an important issue. Uh, it's been raised by the Ghanaian Central Bank with us uh, in the past and we've committed to continue to look at that. I think we do need to get through this transition though first. You know with PLC exiting, set, settling, this, PLC settling, uh, PLC exiting, settling down uh, 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 the shareholders etc etc. But quite clearly whether in Ghana or in other markets it's, it's a very important consideration for us that we keep at the forefront of what we do. It's not at the back, in the background. Let's still, still stay in the banking sector. And some banks are asking for a little bit of time as they reduce their lending rates in response to current developments in the industry. Some commercial banks are yet to reduce their cost of credit despite the significant reduction in key variables that influence cost of credit, including the policy rate. Ishmael Yamsen is a board chairperson of the Standard Chartered Bank. There's a difference between a bank's lending rate and a bank's base rate. The base rate is prescribed by the central bank, base plus whatever. So it is the plus that we should talk about. Why do you add 8% on your base rate or 6% or 4%? It also depends on the efficiency of the banks. Some banks are so efficient that the, the plus will be 5 the plus will be six. Some banks are so inefficient that even if they add 10, they will still make a loss. So then it, 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 then it goes from one bank to another. But what I'm trying to say is that the base rate of banks moves almost automatically with the decline in the policy rate. Mm -hmm. Because it is prescribed by the central bank. And it's more of just a matter of time that these, uh, the chips will fall at the I right I am rate. absolutely sure that if fiscal, the fiscal performance continues to improve, there's no reason why that interest rate won't come down. Remember in 2010, when we had single-digit inflation, we in Standard Chartered Bank were lending at 15%. So it depends very much on the, because you don't, you don't say that 
Today the central bank today the central bank has come down, therefore reduce your interest rate. Why you don't know that three months from now the same central bank is going to go up? So you need to read consistency of performance into the fiscal management and in the monetary environment. Then you are confident enough to adjust. So this is not something you just put on and put bad and put it on and put like you are putting off lights and switching off lights. You need because that's implications for everything. Now, Minister for Works and Housing, Samuel Atta Akshia, has assured government will collaborate with a recently launched construction bank and some other commercial banks in the country to help raise funds for the construction of sea defense walls around the coastal communities in the country. About 1,000 residents over the weekend were displaced by tidal waves in some parts of the Volta and central regions. The Works and Housing Minister said government needs financial institutions to support, finance all the sea defense projects in the country. Given the challenges for the past eight years, we'll be able to meet the infrastructure needs of this country. On the contrary, a bank of this nature will be able to help in solving infrastructure problems by having I mean, good assurances from the government. And then, uh, in tandem, the um, investors will be able to come and wipe out the infrastructure deficit. Because if you look at the huge capital outlay connected to infrastructure, I'm telling you that given the state of our economy currently, there's no way we'll be able to um, clear the deficit. Roads, electricity, um, whatever I want to talk about, which has a huge capital outlay, I don't think the government is having enough money to absorb all these uh, expenditures. Now let's come to the issue of sea defense wars. I mean, we have some projects that are already been undertaken by Amandi Holdings. Is government going to collaborate with Construction Bank to look out for others that are still not, I mean, touched to make sure that they are being... There are several of them that have not been touched. It's all got into cash flow problems. So therefore, can we say that the government will have a good synergy with this bank and say that, look, look we, are, we are being threatened by the sea. Let's get some more people to come and do the sea defense, and then they'll be paid. That is where we should go. But in all these things, we, have, we should bear in mind that there is an extent that you can't commit the government. In terms of the IMF strictures, these are some of the matters which become imperative that if the bank will give concessionary lending arrangements, then we can do good business. But when the need arises, won't you go for the IMF to review some of their constraints? Well, it is something in the pipeline, but I don't want to discuss these matters now. But for sure, the Akufuado government is on the verge of ensuring that anything which will lower the standards of Ghana will be removed, including IMF strictures. Now, Ecobank Ghana and Ecobank Foundation have lent their support for the promotion of education in respiratory therapy in the country. The initiative, which is being implemented in partnership with Charity Beyond Borders, will support the training of BSc degree holders in respiratory therapy from the University of Ghana and the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Speaking with Joy Business, CEO of Ecobank Foundation, Julie Isiam, said the initiative is set to make a substantial mark in the fight for better health care and education in the country. We believe at Ecobank that for any society to be prosperous or to thrive, those three areas we can't take for granted. Any society that has a poor health system is difficult to thrive or is difficult to survive or is difficult to progress. And therefore, health is very, very important to us. Contributing to the health systems, establishing health systems in Ghana is one of the things that we're very passionate about and we care about and definitely one of our visions. So this is aligned, partnering with this respiratory therapy initiative is aligned to our overall vision. We all know the mortality rate around cardiac arrest, asthma. If you look at the list of pulmonary diseases and airwaves, air, air, airways diseases, this program is going to make a significant difference. It's going to make a significant difference not only in adults, but also in children and even new beds. The amount of kids or the amount of people and the amount of lives, let's just say, that this program is going to save is just incredible. And this is only the beginning. We really hope to extend this program beyond the nine students that we've sponsored.
and away from the financial sector. Ghana loses several billions of cities annually due to the neglect of its indigenous leather industry. That is according to a researcher at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Dr. John Osei who is also head of the leather department of the university. He's arguing the industry has great potential which government can explore as a solution to Ghana's unemployment crisis. Love FM's Kwesi Deborah has been exploring the once vibrant industry and how it can propel in the Ghana's industrialization drive. The World Bank's latest report on jobs in Ghana reveals about 48% of the country's youth of between 15 and 24 years are jobless. The population in the age bracket will certainly be higher in the next decade amid concerns about the country's capacity to contain the pressure for jobs. Amidst such conditions are concerns about Ghana's collapsed leather industry. Situated on a 6.37 acre land, the leather and tannery factory of Fumesia is totally abandoned and now up for sale. Is the government going to buy it for the one district, one factory agenda, or is going to allow a private person to take over? Head of Leather Work Department at Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology is passionate about the issue. Dr. John Osebubi says it is economically unsound to have allowed an industry with such great potential to address unemployment to die. He blames successive government for the development. There was a time we interacted with the owners and their complaint was that the farmers are not taking good care of the animals. How do we blame the farmers? And how do we blame the owner of the factory? Because the government has not paid attention to it. Now you look at Kenya. The government pays serious attention to leather as another major source of income for the country. But in Ghana, I've never heard at any point or anybody or government authority talking about the benefit that we can derive from leather. Kumase Abatwa is one of the biggest in the country, receiving 1,000 tons of animals to the slaughterhouse every day. The hide section, especially, is a hub for youth who are looking for a quick way to make money. Ishel Kwakata has been selling hide for 15 years. <laughs> I get 12 hides every day. A hide goes on average for 100 Ghana cities. From 30 to 40. Asawase, a predominantly Muslim community in Kumase, is home of a local leather and tannery located in an area of the community called Majima. The enterprise was set up over 70 years ago long before the township was founded. Bawa, a university graduate, inherited it from the grandfather. He is unable to put exact figure to the number of people who have passed through the factory. He puts it at least 2,000. But the once glowing business is experiencing a dip. In the past, people used to buy leather products. Especially in the Ashanti region, yeah, the traditional way has always been chow chow, the Ohinim Pabwa. They used to come here in their numbers to buy a lot of leathers to go and produce these sandals for the native people of this place. Osei Bunsu makes and sells traditional sandals known as chow chow in central business district of Kumase. He uses local tan leather mostly for his work. Sometimes, however, he would want to use foreign leather because it is easier to work with besides being readily available. Osei believes the weather has been unfavorable for the leather industry. Leather needs sun, but we are battered with rains all the time. William, a shoemaker at Kumasi's Aja suburb, has 25 years of experience in his job. He works with imported leather. 
The locally made ones are not of good quality. I usually import leathers, and uh, the prices of leathers sometimes affects our cost prices. We have the demand for the shoes, but sometimes the prices, customers com um, co complain about the prices. One of the highest consumers of leather is the percussion industry. These two snare drums may look the same. The first has long been known, but the second is recent. Aziz inherited the drum business from his grandfather. He used to sell at least three pieces every day, but he admits the taste of Ghanaians has changed. Most have now developed taste for the new type of drum. It is non grata in the wildlife society, but an indispensable tool in the local grain industry. The pouch of this catapult, don't be deceived, it is not made from local tan leather, but an imported one. Yakunedu has been selling catapults for 10 years. She admits the leather use is gradually losing its value. She complains it tears easily and expensive. The imported ones are cheaper and more durable. Reporting for Joy News, Kwesi Debra. Meanwhile, lecturer Dr. Bobier is calling for government attention and pragmatic steps to revive the fortunes of this industry. Activity or maybe an inferior um, um, business, that's probably why we are not paying attention to it. But if the economic people or the economists and other people who are looking for ventures that can help this country, if they pay attention, even go to central market to take stock of the number of people in this leather business, if they visit Asafu market, okay, and look at the number of people who are in this business or the Asafu township, I think we'll begin to change our mentality towards the leather business. This is live on the marketplace. Let's now have our investment tip for the day. Investment tip is brought to you by Daffin Finance. Deposit, investment, borrowing advisory. Your age and the size of your income should not discourage you from setting money aside every month for investments. The size of your future investment is directly related to the length and frequency of your investment. Develop your budget to know how much you can invest every month. Investment tip was brought to you by Daffin Finance. Deposit, investment, borrowing advisory. Thank you very much for staying on the marketplace. Welcome back. Now, the capital market is expected to return with an upward run after last week's setback. The CD may return stable against other trading counterparts, with the commodities market uh, expected to record mixed results, with cocoa likely to continue shedding some value. Let's now go live on phone uh, to our investment analyst and stock market expert, um, Asei Akutia, who is going to update us currently on how the stock market is going. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome to the marketplace. All right, so we're expecting to reach uh, Asei Akutia. He's an investment uh, expert and a stock market analyst, and he's going to update us currently on how the stock market is going. He's also going to answer some questions on the GACs, uh, especially when some local pharmaceutical companies are calling uh, for government to put place infusion uh, drugs on the list of banned drugs into the country um, and he's going to expect its impact on the stock markets, the GAX market and uh, we, we're not getting in touch with ASEE now. So the marketplace and let's take a short 
Let's take a short break here. We'll be back shortly after this. Thanks for staying. Welcome back. We're now live with Aseya Kutia. He's a stock market analyst to give us an update of the stock market. Uh, Aseya, welcome to Marketplace. Now, how did the market perform last Friday into Monday and how did it go or how is it going currently? Uh, okay, um, last week we had a setback on the market. Um, that was following the previous week being very bullish. Uh, we had a relatively low market volume and value. But this week has started on a very positive note. Um, we've had some equities, especially in the banking stocks, um, leading, leading that charge. So exactly what accounted for last week's uh, dismal performance and the revamp to, uh, this week? All right, usually the trend on a capital market like ours, when you have a week that has a lot of block trades, because the previous week had block trades in Guinness, Ghana, Limited, I think, Enterprise or so. After block trades, usually you have the market cooling off. Um, it's a natural phenomenon with the market. The market cools off a bit before you have a lot more activity coming up. So it's not that entirely strange. It was very expected. And so we saw that, as, as I said earlier, last week. Um, this week, after cooling off, there's a new trading week. Investors are back. Um, major investors who saw the block trade and try to get reasoning behind the block trades, have made decisions as to what to invest in and what not to invest in, and hence the activity for this week. All right, so the market is yet to close, but currently, uh, what do you think are the stocks or the equities that investors must look out for this week? Um, this week, I, I believe that um, Cow Bank Limited ended last week very strongly and started this week also on a very positive note. Sunday Chartered Bank also was telling last week, and this week also we're expecting nothing different from that. Um, in terms of the losers, last week we had the likes of Bob and the Ghana Commercial Bank shedding off some value. They still have excess supply on the market even as we speak. So we expect this week also to be relatively stable for such stocks, and uh, most likely they will dip again this week. All right, let's take a look at the, the currency markets and how is the city performing against uh, other international currencies, especially the U.S. dollar? I guess the U.S. dollar has been relatively stable. Um, a shed of just a few pesos, uh, in percentage terms, almost negligible. It's been relatively stable against the dollar. Mm. Uh, mind you, we're still in the quarter in which we issued a $2.25 billion bond. And also last week, we had about $700 million coming in with a lot of participation from non-resident investors. And so we still do have a good amount of dollars in the system, uh, hence the relative stability of the CD. Um, however, against the pound and the euro, the city has gained some ground, especially against the pound. Last week, the pound suffered a bit, getting to the end of the week. Um, as I, I believe we all know, the elections that happened in the UK, the general elections didn't go the way most of the connoisseurs expected it would, would go. And when it happens like that, you have speculators pulling the plugs, and you have the, the pound suffering against almost all their trading counterparties including the CD. So against the pound and the euro, the CD seemed to gain some, some value. Do we expect the CD to perform, you know, um, creditably against the US dollar before the close of this week? I still expect some stability. Mm -hmm. I still expect some stability. Only last week, Monday, uh, was when we settled the bond, the three-year bond, which have, we had as much as 700 million coming in, uh, with a good amount of that coming from non-resident investors. So we still have some good amount of dollars uh, from the central bank. So I expect the city to remain quite stable and end this week also on a bright note. All right, so what about the, the commodities market? How is it faring? Gold. On the, the commodities market, um, crude oil. Um, did you say gold? Yes, gold, crude oil, and cocoa. Okay, uh, for gold, um, gold has had a bit of a downturn in recent times, okay. uh, mainly because the main buyers of cocoa that's the Asian markets, China and India, are still relatively slow. Um, China is deliberately reducing the rate of growth in the economy, which is hitting hard against a lot of commodities, especially gold. Um, for crude oil, the crisis in the Middle East, coupled with 
the plan to cut production from the OPEC and non-OPEC oil producing countries sure. is also reflecting on the price hike or, or the relative increase in the prices of crude oil. And so that's what you're seeing now. And for cocoa, cocoa has had a bit of a mixed turn. You've had, you have an up and a, and a low. Um, we had excess supply of cocoa from the world's biggest producer, that's Cote d'Ivoire. They actually got more than they forecasted and it's showing a lot of supply on the market. Okay. So though, as we speak, cocoa seems to have a bit of a positive drive to it, I expect it to slow down, get into the end of the week. All right, quickly before you, you go, um, some local pharmaceutical companies are calling for infusion drugs to be included in the ban of um, list of drugs that are imported in the country. Now, we all know that intravenous infusion is doing well on the gas market. Should this take place, yeah. how would it affect um, the market? When you hear market players pushing for a policy drive like this, um, it's good for the local investor. First of all, it's good for the local company and for investors in that company as well as a place to watch um, if indeed the policymakers heed to this cry and they go this way it will mean that there will be a big market a very huge market for intravenous ghana and that will reflect very much in the, the financials or the figures in the near future so it's, it's i expect investors to keep their eyes on the ball mm -hmm. and keep their, their, their ears closely sticking to the, the policymakers mm -hmm. um, if they get wind of anything that's going to happen in that direction, I would expect every investor to really get All on right. the wagon and purchase a, a stock like that. Thank you very much, Aseya Kutia, for your time. That was investment expert Thanks and stock having. market analyst, Akutia Aseye. He's been updating us currently on the development on the stock market as well as the commodity and the currency market. And that will be a wrap for this afternoon's edition of the Marketplace. Many thanks for your company. My name is Manu Abwaji. We have to make a date again, same time tomorrow. Have a good afternoon.